Well, amen. Very good. Second Timothy there in your Bible, if you would. Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. We'll look at a few verses here. Second Timothy chapter 3. I want to give to you that second appendix that goes with the series of lessons we've been dealing with on the believing along the joy of church membership. Before we get into that, I forgot to announce, Lori Singles wanted me to announce that if you'd like to help with those supplies for the care packages for Vacation Bible School that they're making, making care packages to give to our shut-ins, uh, if you'd see her about that, and she can give you all the details concerning that very thing. We flipped over there to Onward Christian Shoulders, the other one. How many of you know that tune to that Onward Christian Shoulders? Yeah, it's a little different tune. And uh, we don't don't sing that very often. And uh, there's a couple other things like there's a couple other songs like that. Um, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. And that's got a different tune to it. And uh, thought about those uh, uh, those different songs like that. Those good hymns. I spoke with Brother Hassler. I don't know why it made me think about this, but it did. I spoke with Brother Hassler uh, Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon. And I was en route riding down Interstate 64, and uh, he called me and uh, talked for a little while. He was actually, last Sunday, he was at the church where my mother and father and my sister and brother-in-law and my nephews were their members uh, down in Virginia. And in the morning, my nephew, my oldest nephew, Wyatt, he played the accordion. And uh, in the evening... They got a double blessing because Brother Hassler played the accordion in the evening. And uh, so not, not very often you go to church and you hear the accordion twice in one day, you know. Uh, but that did happen. And uh, that accordion that my nephew played actually belonged to my great-grandfather. And uh, I never knew my great-grandfather. He passed away uh, before uh, I discovered America. Uh, but uh, he... Uh, Everybody got that one. That's good. <laughs> uh, but he went blind as an, as an older man. And uh, he memorized a lot of different uh, hymns that he could play. And he could play that. He could play the piano, too. Blind. He could play the piano. And uh, he also, I have his Bible. And uh, in his Bible, when he knew he was losing his sight, he started reading his Bible he already read it faithfully, consistently, but he started reading it more. And I've got, I know at the beginning there, he, he's got started, started in January, finished in February. And uh, that's how much he was reading his Bible, trying to memorize scripture and that type of thing. And uh, I praise the Lord for, as, as David said, a goodly heritage. I praise the Lord for that. But anyway, Wyatt picked up his accordion, it was... It was in one of the other family members' possessions, and they weren't playing it anymore, and so they gave it to Wyatt. And he picked the thing right up and just started playing it. Pretty much taught himself how to play it. And uh, God's given him a talent in that way, and praise the Lord for it. I don't know why I was thinking about that, I just was. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse number 12. This morning we talked about worshiping and serving the Lord together as a family. And I told you this morning I was going to give you the other side of that appendix, that second appendix that was in that series of lessons there. You didn't have it in your book, but I have it, and I wanted to share it with you. And the second part of that is listening to the preaching of God's Word. Listening to the preaching of God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I think we're familiar with this portion of Scripture. The Apostle Paul is the penman. Uh, he's writing to Timothy. And we'll pick it up in verse number 12. We'll read to the end of this chapter. He says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 
And, you know, we have a precious treasure uh, that we possess, and that is a copy of God's Word. That's a precious treasure that we have. The Bible calls it here the Holy Scriptures, Paul wrote to Timothy. When we think about the word Scriptures, the word Scriptures means writings. These are the holy writings of God that we have the privilege to have a copy of. And when we hold God's Word in our hand and we hide God's Word in our heart, there's a wonderful thing that takes place because God promises there's a certain work that will be done uh, in having God's Word in our heart and holding God's Word in our hand. There's a work that God desires His Word to accomplish. And He gives it to us right here in this passage. Now, I've probably given this to you before, but just for sake of reminder, and the Bible says a lot about remembering, right, and reminding, uh, let's look at these works of the Word of God as we think about listening to the preaching of God's Word. And we ought to give close attention to what God emphasizes, the priority in the list. And there's a list of things here. What is the first work of the Word of God? Well, look at verse number 15. He says to Timothy that from a child, you remember Timothy's heritage, Eunice and Lois, his mother and his grandmother, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee, here's the first work of the Word of God, wise unto salvation. That is the first work that the Word of God accomplishes. The gospel, the good news, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we know that is the good news. We know that uh, we are not to be ashamed of the gospel, right? In Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. We have the definition of the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul defines the gospel for what it is. It is the good news. And so here he's saying that the first work of the Word of God, Timothy, the first thing that it did in your life was it made you wise unto salvation. You came to an understanding that you were lost without God, without hope, and you came to realize that Jesus Christ is the only way, and you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, in the Word of God, in the Bible, we have the gospel message. But not all of the Bible is the gospel. Not all of it is there, uh, all of the gospel is there, but not all of it that is there is the gospel. And so we have a responsibility to preach the gospel as the Lord Jesus gave that command, that commission, but we are to preach more than the gospel. We are to teach more than the gospel. We are to heed to more than the gospel. We are to preach, as Paul said, we are to preach the whole counsel of God. But if we are going to be able to do that, this first work of the Word of God is going to have to take place. We are going to have to be made wise unto salvation. What's the second work of the Word of God? Well, let's continue. Verse number 16. Paul writes, all, and I've circled that in my Bible, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed and it's profitable. And well, what is it profitable for? Well, it's profitable, first of all, for doctrine. The first work of the Word of God is it makes us wise in the salvation. The second work of the Word of God is it teaches us doctrine. It teaches us doctrine. What is doctrine? It's what we believe and what we teach. Now, very little Bible doctrine, now this, this sounds like an oxymoron, <clears throat> but very little Bible doctrine is being taught in churches today. I didn't say no doctrine is being taught because everybody believes and teaches something. But very little Bible doctrine is being taught. Doctrinal soundness is absolutely essential. It is essential. Matter of fact, someone has said it is uh, it is not the enemy of evangelism, it is the essential of evangelism. If you don't have the right doctrine, then you, you're, in a, you're, you're in a mess, you're in trouble, is what you are. And so when we think about the doctrine, what we believe and what we teach, uh, listen, it's not, it's not what men have written, it's not found in creeds and confessionals like uh, certain denominations hold to things that they just rotely repeat. Uh, that, that, that's not what we're talking about. The sole authority for our doctrine is found in this book. It's not found in a creed. Now, it, a creed or confession may contain some Bible doctrine, but that's not where we go to to find our doctrine. We go to the Word of God to find our doctrine. So it makes us wise into salvation. It teaches us 
uh, uh, doctrine. What else does it do? Well, look there again in verse 16. It's profitable for doctrine for reproof. God's Word tells us where we're wrong. It tells us when we're wrong. In other words, the Bible is a fixed point of reference. It's a fixed point of reference. It, it never varies. It never varies whatsoever. It is always true. It is always the standard. It is always right. And so it reproves us. What else does it do? It corrects us, the Bible says, for correction. In other words, it shows us not only what is wrong, but it shows us how to make things right. Then what else? Look at verse 16, the end of the verse. Not only does it give us doctrine, not does it reprove us and correct us, but it instructs us in righteousness. For instruction in righteousness. Now, our Lord works through His Word. And He works patiently in our lives until we, as we heed to the doctrine, as we allow the Word of God to reprove us, as we allow the Word of God to correct us, and then as we allow it to instruct us in righteousness, what happens? Uh, uh, our living comes in line with the Scriptures. And so we begin to uh, have a pattern of life that is obedient to the Scriptures. Now, do you know there's a difference between being a spiritual and having spiritual maturity? Do you know you can be spiritual in a moment? You can be spiritual in an instant. But just because you make a spiritual decision in an instant doesn't mean that you're spiritually mature. doesn't mean that. Uh, uh, you can make a, that spiritual uh, uh, decision in just a moment, uh, uh, choosing the thing God wants you to do or refusing to do something God doesn't want you to do, and you're spiritual in that moment. But what is spiritual maturity? You can be a Christian receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, knowing your sins are forgiven, knowing that heaven is your home. Uh, and you can be spiritual uh, uh, 30 seconds after you get saved by doing the right thing. But that's not spiritual maturity. What is spiritual maturity? Here it is. It is continuing to make spiritual decisions that leads to spiritual maturity. Day by day, day in and day out, moment by moment, walking with the Lord in obedience to His Word, uh, doing what God has asked of us that is well-pleasing in His sight, leads to spiritual maturity. There is no spiritual maturity apart from this book. There's no spiritual maturity apart from God's Word. And if you're going to be a spiritual, a truly spiritual person, then you're going to have to be a scriptural person, abiding in the truth. Now look at verse number 17. That the man of God, by the way, can I say this? That's not talking just about a preacher. It's not talking about just about somebody who's in the Lord's work, what we say, full time. The truth of the matter is that if you're a Christian, you ought to be a Christian full time. All the time. Jesus said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's with us all the time. So he says here that the man of God may be perfect. That's not just an expression uh, just for people in the Lord's work. It's a term used to mean anyone who is going to be the person that God wants him to be, man or woman, uh, who are saved and will allow the Lord to work in their lives, can become exactly what he says here in verse number 17, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, not sinlessly perfect, but perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. These are the works of the Word of God. It makes us wise in the salvation, it reproves us, it corrects us, and instructions and righteousness that we can be the Christian that God has saved us to be, that we can be complete in Him, that we can live unto good works, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we have these, it's important to grasp these works of the Word of God. Get these down. You ought to, you ought to underline. We'll talk more about this in just a minute. But you ought to underline those in your Bible. You ought to make a note by them. Put in the margin somewhere. The works of the Word of God. Now, I didn't come up with that, but right there they are on the pages of Scripture. These are the works of the Word of God. Now, we're talking about listening to the preaching of God's Word. How should we listen to the preaching of God's Word? Well, let me give you a couple of things, as I did this morning. Just, just some practical thoughts. Maybe you want to, if you didn't bring something to write on tonight, get another offering envelope and write it on there. Number one, seek God. 
Seek God. Now, what are, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, look with me, if you would, over the book of Hebrews. Would you turn over the book of Hebrews for just a minute? And the 11th chapter. Hebrews chapter 11. When you come to the house of God, how do you come? We won't get into why you come tonight. That's a whole other discussion, right? How do you come? What do you come? What is the purpose in your coming? I mentioned the Sunday school hour. We're just kidding of ourselves if we just come here just to meet, just to try to get all pumped up to get deflated again. We're kidding ourselves. We ought to come for a purpose, and the purpose, first and foremost, is to seek the Lord. I'm coming to hear from heaven. I'm coming to desire to know as I come to God's house to worship corporately with His people, with His body. I'm coming to seek Him, to know Him, because I know that He has commanded us to assemble together faithfully, and so I'm coming to hear from heaven. I want to know what God's message is to me tonight. Lord, what do you want, what do you want to speak to me about? It's not out of just rote duty. It's not just uh, what we do on Sunday evening. No, I'm coming to hear from heaven. God, what are you trying to speak to me about? So, first of all, seek God. Look in Hebrews chapter 11. Seek Him. You know, this really, this ought to take place even before you ever enter the door. This ought to take place before you leave to come. Ask Him to make Himself known to you. Look in Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently, what's that next word? Seek Him. So did you come? Did you come tonight? Did you come this morning? Do you, do you come on a consistent basis to this place to hear the preaching of the Word of God, whether it be uh, from the mouth of this preacher or some other preacher who will stand here and preach? Do we come to hear the Lord? Do we come to seek God, to know what God wants for us, to desire what the Lord desires? Seek God. Let me give you the second thing. Listen carefully. Listen carefully to the Word of God. Uh, when the preacher begins to read the Bible, listen to the Scriptures. Follow along as they're read. Think about this. God speaks to us through His Word. God speaks to us through other Christians. And God speaks to us through the circumstances of life. But remember this. Those last two things never trump the first thing. Say, so what do you mean? I mean that if some other... Christian gives you advice that's contrary to the Word of God, you can mark off that advice. If the circumstances of life go in contradiction to the Word of God, because we've got to be careful, all of us know that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. And we can manipulate sometimes, we can manipulate our circumstances, can't we? So be careful of just taking what other people say. They may be good people, they may be sincere people. They may be true Christian people, but if they give you advice that goes against the truth of Scripture, mark that off. Mark that advice off. What are you saying? I'm saying listen carefully to God's Word. Listen carefully to God's Word. The third thing. Listen without prejudice to the speaker, to the preacher. Now, all of us here tonight have our favorite people that we like to hear. Uh, we have our favorite preachers. Be careful, because if that's the only person we'll hear, we got to be careful there. If I'm prejudiced, if I'm prejudiced against certain preachers, uh, then I'm not going to listen as I should listen. I, I'm, I'm going to be too bothered about who's doing the speaking and not about who's trying to speak to my heart. And that's the Spirit of God. Be careful about being prejudiced toward the preacher. And the next one dovetails right along with that thought. Depend on God and not the preacher. Depend on God and not the preacher. As I said, we all have our preacher. That's my preacher. That's the certain preacher. Uh, uh, and, and when I hear that preacher, I'm blessed. And some people say, I don't hear that preacher. I'm, I'm not blessed. I'm not blessed unless I hear that preacher. 
You know what's wrong? They're looking for the preacher to be a blessing instead of the Lord to be a blessing. Look to the Lord. Depend on the Lord, not the preacher. Here's another thought. Apply what you hear to your own life. Apply what you hear to your own life. You ever sat in a meeting and you thought this? Don't raise your hand. This rhetorical question. Well, I wish so-and-so would have been here. That's a good message for them. Hey, if so-and-so isn't here, it wasn't for them. It was for me, because I was here. The preacher's not preaching to somebody else. He's preaching to you, and he's preaching to me. Yeah. So what should I say? I should say, Lord, speak to me. Speak to my heart. May my heart be open and receptive and ready to hear. Lord, thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for dealing with me. You know, every person who seeks to hear the Lord's voice can hear the Lord's voice. They can hear it. I'm not talking about audible. I'm talking about uh, uh, through the message of the Word of God. They can hear the Lord's voice, and God speaks to them. That's what He desires to do. No matter who's, who's up here, let me give you another thought. Some of these, you say, these are, these are just real, real simple. Good. Bring your Bible and use it. Bring your Bible and use it. Follow along as the preacher reads the Bible. Use your Bible. Make notes of verses. Underline things. There's things that you'll want to go back and, 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 and make special note of uh, that someone pointed out in a Sunday school lesson or in a sermon somewhere or, or just giving some thoughts from Scripture. And you need to underline it and say, okay, that's where that is. And that's when it was. Make special note. It's not a sin. It's not a sin to underline things in your Bible. It's not a sin to do that. I encourage you to do that. Use the right pen to do it. But do it. It'll help you. I've got Bibles by the, the uh, droves back there. And uh, most of them are marked up from one end to the other. Make special notes. Underline things. Bring your Bible and use it. Here we go. Another thought. Pray that God will speak to you. Pray that God will speak to you. How many times we come into the, to the house of the Lord and we come in and we just sit down, you know? Okay, I'm here. Bless me. I made it. I mean, I got back here at 6.30 tonight. Bless me now. Well, the fact of the matter is I need to be praying, as I mentioned earlier, I need to be praying for I ever get here. Uh, and what should I be praying uh, I should be praying for the person who's doing the preaching. Lord, help, help the one who's preaching. Help the one who's preaching. And then pray for yourself. Lord, help me as I'm listening. Give me an understanding of what's being said. And then, Lord, thank you for speaking to my heart. Thank you for speaking to my heart. Help me to remain open to hear your word, open to hear your truth. A lot of people listen to preaching like they listen to a speech. They just come and sit. Have you ever, have you ever just, I know you have probably, you sit and you've heard politicians or something like that speak. It's just empty, isn't it? Most of the time it's the same thing they said the last time they spoke. And the last time they spoke. And the last time they spoke. It's just the same thing over and over and over and over again. But, hey, it's different when we hear the preaching of God's Word. We, we should approach uh, uh, the preaching of God's Word to hear the voice of God. I want to hear what God uh, wants to to speak to me about how he wants to deal with me and what we, we have the singing and we have the, the preaching of the word of God in a church service, what? To enter in, to meet the Lord. We sing certain songs to prepare our hearts to enter into worship that we can hear from God, allow God to speak to us. God uses the preaching. Not foolish preaching, but the foolishness of preaching. Right? Right? That's what Paul said, the heralding forth of the Word of God. What does that do? It cranks our spiritual engines. It, it, it enables us to, uh, to feed on the Word of God and to heed what God has said and uh, to march off, as we talked about this morning, to, to march out as, as onward Christian soldiers, as we just sang. Preaching accomplishes what nothing else can accomplish as God initiates a work in our heart through the preaching of His Word. Let me give you another thought. Take notes. Take notes. 
And you've probably heard this expression. A short pencil is better than a long memory. Have you ever sat in a service and the preacher said something and you wanted to tell somebody else about it later, but you forgot? You forgot exactly how they said it. You forgot exactly how they put it. Maybe there's a certain passage of Scripture they pointed to and God turned the light bulb on in your heart and mind about a certain thing. And when you walked out, you didn't write it down, you walked out and you forgot where it was. You ever done that? I've done that. You see, as the, as the, as the preaching goes forth, there are certain things that's going to be said that you want to remember. Be prepared. Be prepared to take notes. There are things God is going to say that you are going to want to remember and look back at and point back to. Maybe there's a particular point, some spiritual insight on a verse, and you want to make a special note by that verse. The next time that you're reading through the Bible, you're reading that verse, and you can see the comments on that verse, and you can remember how God spoke to your heart, how He dealt with you. Another great thing to do is when you, when you take notes and you go home after the service, read back through them. This is what, it'll help solidify some things in your mind. This is what God spoke to me about. Now, this is not a classroom. That's not what the preaching service is. But there are certain things that God speaks to us about in preaching meetings that we'll want to remember and, and we'll want to apply them and live them out in our lives and we need to be able to repeat them. Think about that. We need to be able to repeat them to others. I said just a moment ago, You've probably heard messages. I know people have talked to you. Some of you have talked to me about certain messages you've heard. And you remembered them. You remember certain things stood out. Maybe you made note of them and you remember them. And you spoke about them. You said something about them. What were you doing? You wanted the truth that changed in your heart, in your life, to be able to impact and influence others and change their heart. By the way, by the way, don't, don't, get to, don't get too nervous about people repeating things to you. Don't get too nervous about them uh, repeating things that they've heard that's helped and encouraged them. If it helped and encouraged them, it might just help and encourage you somewhere down the lane. Take notes. What else? Express appreciation to God and to the speaker, the preacher, for the message. We ought not ever leave the house of God without thanking God for using His Word to speak to our hearts. Thank the Lord that we're ever to hear. And when someone has been a blessing, uh, I like whenever we have guest preachers, I like to, to send them out first so that you can greet them on the way out. And when you greet them on the way out, you can express your appreciation to them. Thank you for coming. God bless you for being here. The message was a blessing and encouraged my heart. You know, there's a way to, to speak to people that way without trying to exalt the man. You can exalt the message. Thank God for the message. Boy, I tell you one thing. The Lord really used you. The Lord used you. So you can be an encouragement. Now, listen. The man of God, the true man of God, doesn't depend upon the encouragement of others. He depends on the Lord. He depends on the Lord. But there's something very good about encouraging one another. Encouraging one another. By the way, you can, encourage, you can encourage the preacher in the message. How can you do that? Amen. That's good. Praise the Lord for that. That's right. Nothing wrong with saying those things. Nothing wrong whatsoever. Yes, encourage, encourage the preacher and exalt the Lord. Not exalted the man, you're exalted the Lord. Here's another one. Obey the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. Obey the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. As God speaks to you, then allow the Word of God to do exactly what Paul told Timothy about there in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Allow it to do what? Allow it to do a perfect work in you, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. These are just a handful of simple little things that we can use as we listen to the preaching of the Word of God. And if we will, I think we'll be much more apt to hear the voice of God and have the Lord speak to us. The reason to hear, the reason to hear, here it is, is to obey. That's the reason to hear. The reason to hear is to obey. May God help us to listen to the preaching of the Word of God, 
with a hearing ear, with a hearing heart, and an obedient spirit to do what God speaks to us about. Let's bow in prayer together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.